That was lovely. That was beautiful, gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Uh, I messed you up on the two ubi. I decided to be a tenor singing as an alto for a second, and then I said, to be because yeah. it's fine. Um, beautiful, beautiful, perfect, never change. Um, every time we sing, Lord, make me an instrument. Like I said last week, think an instrument. Lord, take me an instrument. Put that in on the top note. It's going to make it a better legato for us. Um, okay, going back, going back. The where there is hatred, love me so love, y'all sound so nice. It was beautiful. Sopranos, you really did a great job on the bass um, suspension into that G sharp. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, at the middle of page four, a uh, particular soprano, Christine Brown, Christine Hart, um, started on beat one of measure 17. I know I did. Uh, Not only that, I said, 16, we have to go up to the, whatever that is, D, right? Wherever I there's really there. Oh. Okay. okay, honestly, didn't hate, didn't hate, didn't hate the little harmony they got out of there, okay. but, um, I, I do not feel that Christine would make that, or anybody would make that mistake again. I think that was a top left thing, so we're not going to rerun that section. Just to make sure, um, in this section, more often than not, we cut off on beat four. There is doubt, faith, wherever there's despair. Oh, okay, great. Um, where there's darkness, light. Where there, then make sure you've got a good breath on those quarter reps, sorry, eight reps, okay? Um, and then I just want to do the first entrance. Sopranos and Alphas, I was not convinced. <laughs> Your first show was great. You came in on the exact right starting pitch. It, it was a little bit uh, clumsy from there. So okay. let's just make sure we're right on the tempo together, and then we're right on the text together, and that if a word ends in a consonant sound, like make or instrument, uh, that we take that to the next syllable so we've got a nice legato. And also, don't rush me. It's beautiful. Okay. Um, okay, great. From the beginning. So that was right, but then it sounded like a 
actually didn't find out until yesterday from Karen Erner's Facebook post. Uh, it was a, it, in the bulletin for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, she passed on Tuesday. Uh, it was very unexpected is my only understanding. Uh, I'm going to be very honest with you. I have no relationship or connection to Eric. Um, so I don't know them. However, um, and we all know that the, the circumstances of, of their departure was a little cloudy or wor worrisome. Um, however, I'm happy for those of you who were members of the choir at that time and are close with them or felt some kind of connection to them over the like 10 years of music ministry we did here. Um, if you want to, we have the information for the services. I would be happy to formally put together some form of like floral arrangement. I would like to put it from the members of the UCC choir rather than from the UCC choir because I do feel like given the circumstances of the departure, I don't, I don't want to do anything uncomfortable, so I'd rather it be directly from you, but I'm happy to coordinate it. So I will include that in my email later today, um, and I will handle it. So I will just reach out to Megan if you're interested in, in, in giving to some form of well, probably a floral arrangement for the memorial service. I'd be happy to take that and run with it. That's not until May, isn't that correct? Yeah, I believe we've got some time. They've done it's like quite a bit from now. It's not right now. Yeah. Um, May. May, May yeah. So I I will go ahead and include it so I can go ahead and get it all put together because I feel like sometimes we rush these things a little. I'd rather have it done and prepared. So we're going to go ahead and do that. But just know that you know um, obviously they had a big part of this ministry for a long time, and so. We want to acknowledge that in a way that doesn't feel uncomfortable or tense um, on such a delicate time. So that's how we're going to handle it. Um, sorry, I assumed that most of us knew that's why I didn't I drop it. Not like all shelf. I could have done that more sensibly. I just assumed we did. Um, but, um, but yeah, so there's that information. Sorry to be the bearer of that. Um, but, um, again, we'll do something for this. Um, so we have the prayers of the people, the pastoral prayer, the Lord's prayer. We have our regular doxology. We are not changing the doxology for Lent, so it's still our normal. Praise God for whom all blessings flow. Praise God for all that you receive. Love, praise God for all that love the Son, Spirit, Christ, and Spirit. One prayer. Simple. We got it. Um, after that, we'll have the announcements. That will take a very long time. If you, well, we don't even have to back the bulletin, so you don't even know. It's a little wild today. Um, and then we have God of grace and God of glory. Um, what? Um, you know, probably no. <laughs> um, I we said we would do all five, but um, y'all know how that's gonna be. So I will not take a chance today. Uh, but let's start at the Grantus wisdom. So second to last measure of the third wisdom uh, of God of grace and God of glory.
Um, we'll make sure you do that too. Then we have the benediction, and then we have a new choral benediction that I'm so excited about because it's a setting of a Desmond Tutu text. Um, and it's beautiful. Rather than having you sing it straight out, I'm going to ask you all to play it quickly for you. Also, for Lent, the choral benediction will always be in the bulletin because it's a hymn. Okay? So you'll have it. Uh, but uh, I'm going to ask you all to play it. Just look through it, hum your part, whatever, and then we'll try to sing it in a second. It's, it looks like it could kill you. It's in the roll. So, one, three, two.
Bless the ones who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with the ones who rejoice. Weep with the ones who weep. With one another, be harmonious. Be not arrogant, but associate with the humble. Do not make yourselves out to be wiser than you are. Evil for evil, you shall not repay anyone. Consider before time what is good in the sight of all. If possible, from your ability, with every human person, live in peace. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved. Beloved, rather leave space for the wrath of God. For it is written, to me belongs vengeance. I will repay, says the Holy One. No, if your enemy hungers, feed them. If they thirst, give them something to drink. For by so doing, burning coals shall you heap on their head. Do not overcome by evil, rather overcome with good. Okay, that's just awkward. <clears throat> now King Herod heard of the teaching of Jesus, for Jesus' name had been known, had become known, and some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and that is why these powers work through him. Yet others said, it is Elijah, while others said, it is a prophet, like the one of the prophets of old, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men to who seized John and bound him in prison because of, really, his wife's name was Herodias? Because of Herodias, the wife of his brother, Philip. Wow. For Herod had married her. Okay. I have questions. For John had told Herod, it is not right for you to have your brother's wife. Now Herodias had a grudge against him, and she wanted to kill him, but she could not. This was because Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous man and a holy man, and he protected him and listened to him. Though greatly perplexed, yet it pleased him to listen to him. Okay. Now, an opportune time came on Herod's birthday when he gave a banquet for his courtiers and commanders for the leaders of Galilee. And Herod's daughter, Herodias, wow, this is so confusing, and Herod's daughter, Herodias, came in and danced, pleasing Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he swore to her repeatedly, whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. And when she went out and said to her mother, what should I ask? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she returned to the king with haste and asked, saying, I want immediately for you to give me on a platter the head of John the baptizer. The king was deeply sorry, yet because of his oaths and the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier under her orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison. Oh my gosh, he's Navalny. And he thought he brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Wow.
this last one. Good morning, testing. One, two, three. Oh, as I drop the mic pack. Oh. Sounds pretty, pretty good, though. Okay. Can you say another word? All right, thank you.
Testing, testing, one, two.
let there be peace on earth. Let it begin with me. Thank you, Bill Choir. And good morning. Welcome to Union Congregational Church. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We are gathered together on this, in this first sun, the first Sunday in Lent as we begin our journey towards Easter. This is a season of preparation, of reflection and repentance, one of the holiest times of the Christian calendar. The 40 days of Lent are opportunities to return to God, to prioritize our spiritual practices, to seek shalom in our hearts and in the world, where this has been another week where it is so desperately needed. So wherever you are on your own spiritual journey, whatever pains or anxieties or sorrows you carry with you this morning, let us come together before God and in the company of a loving community to worship. Will you please rise in body or spirit and join me in the call to worship? In this season of Lent, we come seeking peace. We seek serenity within ourselves. We seek harmony within our families. We seek goodwill among our neighbors. We seek a ceasefire among all nations. We seek not just the absence of conflict, but the presence of shalom, the abiding peace, the healing life, the unrelenting justice that God calls us to in Christ. Let us worship with divine hope. Would you join me in our responsive litany of confession and assurance? But thus says the Lord, seek shalom wherever you are, and pray to the Lord for your shalom shall be found in the shalom of the community. We find ourselves in exile caused by relationships, economics, and failing health. But thus says the Lord, seek shalom wherever you are and pray to the Lord, for your shalom shall be found in the shalom of your community. We thirst for God's promised justice through swift vengeance. But thus says the Lord, seek shalom wherever you are and pray to the Lord, for your shalom shall be found in the shalom of the community. We strive to protect our families and our interests from any battle. But thus says the Lord, seek shalom wherever you are and pray to the Lord, for your shalom shall be found in the shalom of the community. We 
But thus says the Lord, seek shalom wherever you are and pray to the Lord, for your shalom shall be found in the shalom of the community. May our actions embody our prayers for the healing of the community and the world, and therein may we find a long-awaited wholeness. Amen. Friends, as we seek our shalom, as we look to a God who forgives us and walks with us each day, each moment of our life, may we share that peace, that forgiveness with each other. The peace of Christ be with you all. Our first scripture reading is from Romans 12, 14 to 21. Bless the ones who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with the ones who rejoice. Weep with the ones who weep. With one another, be harmonious. Be not arrogant, but associate with the humble. Do not make yourselves out to be wiser than you are. Evil, for evil you shall not repay anyone. Consider before time what is good in the sight of all. If possible, from your ability, with every human person, live in peace. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved. Rather, leave space for the wrath of God. For it is written, to me belongs vengeance. I will repay, says the Holy One. No. If your enemy hungers, Feed them. If they thirst, give them something to drink. For by doing so, burning coals shall you heap on their head. Do not be overcome by evil. Rather, overcome evil with good. All right, I invite any other children who are here to come join me and Walter up here on the chancel steps. Good to see you all. Ten minutes ago, I was getting worried I was going to be talking to myself at this point, but glad you made it. Good morning, good morning. That would be the Lord and I don't try. Yeah. Probably don't try. Oh, well, Elmo's joining us and some other friends. Wonderful. Good morning. You can come take a seat wherever, right on the floor, wherever you're comfortable. The babies about to be giant tail. They can come because they want to be with us in worship, right? Do you want to sit right up here next to me? Why is my brother and Melissa three years old? So if, yeah, if they're three or younger, they can decide whether they want to come here. Do you want to sit right here, Xander? Awesome. Okay. So good to see you all. And I want to say congratulations to you, Catherine. I heard you were in a show last weekend, and it was awesome. I hope you had fun. So we are in a new season in the church. Does anyone know what that season is called? Huh? You think you know? Lent. Lent, that's right. Awesome. Does anyone know what Lent is? Mm. What it's about? It's the time before Easter. That's right, it's the time before Easter. Does anyone know how long it is? Uh, yeah? 42 days? Close, not 42. 40. So 40, but we don't count the Sundays because Sundays are sort of a break. They're, they're called Little Easters. Okay, so. No, they're not. So there is technically 42, right? Uh, I think if you counted the Sundays, there'd be 45, because there's five Ooh, Sundays. Yeah. But so there's 40 days in Lent. And so it's the season before Easter, and it's sort of the time where we get ready for Easter. We prepare for it. How do you think we prepare for Easter? How do you prepare to go to school? 
pack your backpack. You pack your backpack? Yeah, what do you put in your backpack? Lunch. Lunch. Not always. Lay down on the couch. You lay down on the couch. Wow, you must have a very relaxed morning routine. Not always. You don't have to pack. Sometimes you pack your lunch, sometimes you get lunch at school. What else do you have to do to prepare for school? Oh, do your homework. You watch TVs? What? Maybe. <laughs> you have to bring your homework? Yeah. You have to do your homework, and then you have to like, remember to bring it. I don't do my homework. You'd, I don't believe you. You have to pack your water bottle, because you might get thirsty. Yep. I don't pack it. What about, what else? How about um, on your body I don't or on your feet? I don't pack any of my stuff. My mom does. Put your shoes on. My slippers. Yep. Xander, when you go to school and it's really cold outside, what else do you wear? Jacket. A jacket. That's right. And snow pants and, and a hat. And yes, slippers. slippers. If, if maybe if you're having pajama day. What if it's rainy? So there's all sorts of things that we do to prepare for our days, day to day. But preparing for Easter is a little different. And there have been three things that Christians have done to prepare for Easter, tr traditionally. And those three things are praying, fasting. What do you know what fasting means? I'll get to these in a minute, won't I? Yes. Not eating, yes. It doesn't mean you don't eat at all, but you have certain times when you don't eat. Why and then not? the last is called almsgiving. What in the world? Anyone know what in the world that is? is that Anyone out there know what in the world almsgiving is? No one? No. Donation. So it's almsgiving is like giving money away to poor people, to Ooh. people who need it, sharing what you have oh, with and others. The get up like so. Those are sort of three things that we would do to be able to focus on Jesus. Because sometimes there are things in our life that take up a lot of our time and attention, but they distract us from what's really important. They distract us from God and from Jesus. And so these are just things that people would do to try to focus on that. So I want to talk to you today about one kind of... Oh, the other thing I just wanted to say about that is that... My mom has can you Can you do a little more listening? Um... We don't just give things up in order to think about ourselves, but we also do it because if, if we use a little less, then there's more to share. There's more for other people. And so one way of thinking about it is if we eat a little less, we have more food to share with others. If we use a little less money, we have more to give away. Now, there is one kind of special food that we eat in Lent. Pretzels. Pretzels. Yeah, yeah baby. So uh, we will get one pretzel on your way to learning centers. Why in the world are pretzels a good food for Lent? Uh, they're, they're yummy. They're yummy. <laughs> they're dry. They're dry. So let me ask you about the ingredients in pretzels. Do you think there are a lot so, of ingredients or a few ingredients? A few. A few. So they're sort of salt. a simple food. Salt is an important one. Flour. Flour. Dough. To make the dough. You need water. That's, that's pretty much it. I mean, there might be a few other things, but Funnel. and yeast. yeast. You need Funnel. some sort of yeast. The, a lot of the pretzels we eat do have butter, but the original pretzels were very simple. Now, how about the shape? Let me take one out so we can look they at can it. They look like a pumpkin. They're like twisted together. They're twisted together. Yeah. They can look like a pumpkin. What about they can look like what about the out? Walter, can you please wait? Cool. What about the outside shape? What They're does that cool. look like? They look like hearts. That's right. So it looks like a heart on the outside with a twist in the middle. And the twist kind of looks like... A peace sign. It does look a little bit like a peace sign. The other thing it looks like Mommy. is... What are these? When you have your hands like this, what are you doing? Praying. Praying. So there was a monk a long time ago, like 1,500 years ago. A monk is somebody who was sort of like a minister, but they lived sort of away from a community, and they like spent all of their time praying and working for God, essentially. And so this monk, 1,500 years ago, made the first pretzels during the season of Lent. And so they're both simple ingredients, and it's also a reminder to keep prayer in your heart. So we're going to say a prayer, and then you can each take a pretzel with you as you go to learning centers, if you want. So will you pray with me? Will you put your hands and sort of look like a pretzel? And repeat after me. Dear God... Thank you for loving us. Thank you for a time to remember to pray. And thank you for pretzels. Amen. All right. You guys want a pretzel? You want a pretzel? No. Would you like a pretzel? 
All right. Thanks, Phoebe. Have fun in learning centers. Go ahead. Those are big steps with your hands full. <laughs> Our next reading is from Mark 6, 14 through 29. Now King Herod heard of the teaching of Jesus, for Jesus' name had become known. And some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and that is why these powers work through him. Yet others said, it is Elijah. While others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who seized John and bound him in prison because of Herodias, or Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. For Herod had married her. For John had told Herod, it is not right for you to have your brother's wife. Now Herodias had a grudge against him, and she wanted to kill him but she could not. This was because Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous man and a holy man, and he protected him and listened to him, though greatly perplexed, yet it pleased him to listen to him. Now an opportune time came when, <clears throat> on Herod's birthday, when he gave a banquet for his courtiers and commanders for the leaders of Galilee. And Herod's daughter, Herodias came in and danced, pleasing Herod with his, and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he swore to her repeatedly, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she returned to the king with haste and asked, saying, I want immediately for you to give me, on a platter, the head of John the baptizer. The king was deeply sorry, yet because of his oaths and the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier under orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison. And he brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God.
pray with me? God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be instruments of your peace. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Quite the story. Cue the Game of Thrones music. Cue Strauss's Salome. Cue the Sopranos, Succession, Sons of Anarchy, Othello. Cue the nightly news with reports of the powerful caught in webs of licentiousness, bad behavior, and loyalty to one another and their power over their responsibilities and ethics. Cue the death of Alexei Navalny. This is a story that seems more appropriate for the news or the dark drama of stage or screen than for church. And if it seems like a strange place to begin Lent, it is indeed a stark contrast to the more traditional lectionary passage for this week of Jesus in the wilderness. But if Jesus in the wilderness conjures individual spiritual fortitude, it's also a symbolic representation of Jesus's resistance to the evils of this world. And this story is a dramatic representation of those powers and principalities. Dr. Wilda Gaffney, the scholar behind the women's lectionary that we have been following this year, has made an astute choice to draw us into this season of Lent with the worst realities of the world on full display. And with a clear foreshadowing of Jesus' own death at the hands of the state in a few weeks. So here we are. The story's out there. And we are repulsed, uncomfortable, and probably skeptical that there's any good news to be found here. The story of John's execution comes to us in this sixth chapter of Mark, not at the time of John's death in the chronological uh, series of the gospel, but in the context of Herod speculating about who this Jesus is as a flashback. Because in this moment, Herod fears that Jesus is John resurrected. And so Mark, the usually brief, concise, sparing author Mark, gives us an unusual amount of details in this story. Why? And why does this story of John's execution come here, right in between the sending out of the disciples and their return and the feeding of the 5,000? This is the heart of Jesus' ministry expanding and its placement brings into stark contrast two very different banquets. There is Herod's birthday party, debaucherous, luxurious, over the top, and shortly thereafter, when Jesus' disciples return from their first ministry, the feeding of the 5,000. When Jesus miraculously turns a few loaves and fish into a feast for the masses. There's probably a literary term for this kind of juxtaposition, you English majors can tell me afterward, and you can imagine the cinematic potential. Crossfade between the drunken laughter of the king and his court and the hungry faces of the peasants. Slow zoom with dramatic music over the half-eaten carcass of meat left over on the royal table and the meager calories torn and shared on the barren mountain the kingdom of heaven, clearly unlike the kingdoms of earth. But there's more. Mark's character development provides us with some details about Herod's inner struggle that reveal the interpersonal elements of this epic struggle between political power and prophetic faith. You see, Herod liked John the Baptist. He was compelled by him perhaps convinced of many of his prophetic teachings. But John crossed the line when his criticism became personal. When John's critique of power called out the unethical marriage between Herod and his brother's wife, 
Herod could no longer deny that he was implicated in the truth that John spoke. And still we see Herod wrestling with these divided loyalties to his family or to the prophetic truth and wisdom that John spoke. And at the end of the day, or I should say the end of a long night of drinking and debauchery, his true loyalties overtake him and John is the sacrificed victim. While this scene captures the high drama of ultimate power, we tell this tale at the beginning of Lent to remind ourselves that the God we follow is at odds with the places of power in this world. And that each of us faces choices to navigate the complex web of relationships that we embody. Choices towards self-protection or towards God's transformation of the world. Lent is a season of reflection and repentance. Repentance means a turning around, going another way. This is a season where we hold the slow march of Jesus towards confrontation with ultimate earthly power alongside our own journeys in faith. While Herod is easily cast as a one-dimensional villain in this drama, he also represents the very human reality of being caught between, of wanting to find peace by not angering anyone, by trying to keep everyone happy. He arrests John, but doesn't want to kill him. He tries to pretend that the power he wields is not the evil John speaks of. And the reality is that these are impossible aspirations because prophetic faith will not sit comfortably with political power. But aren't these also, in less dramatic fashion, the daily struggles of integrity that we all face? Perhaps we aren't faced with holding another's life in our hands, but daily we wrestle with trying to balance our inner compasses with the poles of relationships and the world. We walk tight ropes of balancing our own needs with all that is demanded of us. We struggle to prioritize, to keep others' opinions of us positive. We weigh how to live out the ethics that we aspire to. How does a tired parent hold a boundary with a tantruming toddler? How does one navigate relationships that feel one-sided or less than right? How does a professional navigate time for their family or personal priorities alongside a desire to be liked, respected, and valued at work? How do families have their schedules reflect their priorities and not risk jeopardizing their teens' friendships or future possibilities? How do we as a church balance our own needs with those of the wider community and the suffering world? We are pushed and pulled and frayed at the edges. Sooner or later, in some circumstance, we all face the reality that something must give. Choices must be made because we can't do it all. We can't keep everyone else happy all the time, and maintain integrity of self. These inner conflicts simmer beneath the surface, and eventually they must be excavated and confronted before resolution is found. If we were hoping for an easy path to inner and outer peace, our first lesson this Lent in our search for shalom is that this path is not a placid one. The path to shalom will be disruptive. Disruptive to our inner equilibrium and disruptive to the powers of the world. Neither John nor Jesus sought to establish political rule. And yet the truth that they told and the power they demonstrated to heal and transform provoked the power to respond with violence. They called upon individuals and communities to give up self-preservation 
and prioritize the transformation of the world into shalom, wholeness and well-being for all. We're left with the unresolved tension of the choices ahead of us. The scene ends today with a body laid in a tomb. We know that we will return to that scene, spoiler alert, with a major plot twist in about six weeks. But for today, let us be disturbed. Let us be challenged by the world as it is. And let us go searching for the shalom that is to come. May it be so. Every once in a while, you're very happy there's a hymn placed after the sermon. I want to begin our concerns and joys this morning by saying mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. As staff, we had a rather disjointed week. So there will be a number of errors that we'll find in the joys and concerns. For example, the Siona's grandchild has not been born in the future. <laughs> what was the date of Edie's birth? The 10th. So the joy that we share is not futuristic. It is in the past, it has happened. And we have a number of names misspelled and or wrong. And as the person who redid the bulletin, I will accept responsibility for that. So as we go through this, keep in mind, sometimes the grace we preach, we need ourselves. In our concerns, it has been a tough week. We mourn the death of Sue Bryan, mother of Dan Gillespie, mother-in-law to Katrina, grandmother to Walter and Carl on Thursday evening. We mourn the death of Pamela Olson, spelled S-E-N, on February 13th, the wife of Eric Olson and a former section leader in this church's choir. But we also had the joy 
that there were two grandchildren born, Edie to Annie and Jesse, grandparents, Michelle and Paul Sionis, and Hannah Grace Lee, who is the daughter of Liz, Phil and Jeanette Miller's granddaughter. We also ask for prayers for Lee Montgomery, who is in the hospital with a staph infection after surgery. We pray for Liz Kaplan as she undergoes her treatments while she's at Montclair Care Center. We pray for a complete recovery for Judy Nesbitt, who is at home. We remember Clarissa Schock, the Reverend Bill Lutz, the Reverend Cindy Reynolds, the Reverend Bob Castles, Reyes Berrios, the husband of Charles, Ina's niece Kelly, and for Dawn Ermler Fisher. And do we have other joys and or concerns that we wish to share? Jane? For future reference, there is a memorial service scheduled for Pam Olson on May 11, and that information can be put in the bulletin when that approaches. Are there other? Susan. I'm very grateful for the uh, humility and humor of uh, you and the entire uh, staff of Union. Things don't always go right, and it's good when we can accept that, and I'm grateful that the congregation can just roll with it, because we, we all get through this together. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And your grandmother's name? Cindy. Prayers for Cindy, who passed away this week, and for her children as they gather, and as they remember her, and as families are wont to do, tensions arise. <laughs> Katrina. Prayer for Katrina's great aunt Bonnie, who is recovering from a fall. If there are no other joys and concerns to be raised, let us be in an attitude of prayer. Steadfast God, thank you for sheltering us through the storms of life. Thank you for ministering to us through angels seen and unseen in times that test us. Thank you for claiming us as a people beloved forever. Because of your great love and care for us, we trust you in our brightest joys and deepest needs. We rejoice when dark clouds of trouble are overtaken by the light of your presence and new possibilities. When things settle down after a time of tossing about, when the great storm is over, and when the promise of resurrection life takes hold in us with a sure and certain hope. Hear our prayers, we ask, for the deep needs of our world. In places of violence and warfare, give us the courage to lay down our weapons of death and promote life and well-being instead. In places of drought and fire, 
bring rains that make the earth colorful and verdant again. In places where the waters overtake their boundaries, allow the overflowing chaos to recede. Loving God, in life and in death, we belong to you. So in the midst of life, we entrust ourselves to your care. We are bold to ask for hope when we are confused, lost, or afraid. We are eager to ask for healing for our bodies and minds, whether wounded, ill, or recovering. And we are unceasing in our prayers for those we love who are far from us physically, emotionally, or spiritually. In the midst of death and grief, even though we are weary, we return again and again, praying for comfort, for an easing of the pain that comes from loss, and for the light of your presence to pierce our present darkness. As the heavens were torn open at Jesus' baptism and the curtain in the temple was torn at his crucifixion, so now tear open anything that divides us from you or hides your presence in our lives or in the church. We desire to hear your voice of love to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and to see you clearly. Lead us to serve others faithfully as authentic disciples of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As I said to the kids, almsgiving is a traditional Lenten practice. It's a practice that allows us to embody the biblical call to love and care for our neighbors, to be generous and merciful, and place the love of God ahead of the love of mammon. Now, if this is your first time here, we invite you to fill out a welcome card and put it in the offering plate as your offering today, as you are guests and we are glad to have you with us. May we all use this time to reflect on how we are called to follow Christ, to show compassion and steward the resources available to us in God's creation.
Abundant God, receive these gifts of love from your servants and use them for the breaking in of your kingdom of love and shalom. In the name of Jesus, whose ways calls us for forth in service, we pray. Amen. We begin our announcements this morning with a special announcement by Maggie. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm here to welcome you all and remind you that on March 3rd, we are going to have one of our wonderful dinners at church. I think it starts at 5, and um, it was is a Pennsylvania Dutch dinner. And at that time, we will also honor Dorothy McGann. And if you don't know Dorothy, well, she's 96, very active, mentally especially. And um, in the 1950s, she was a liberated woman long before woman's liberation even existed. And she was also very active in gun control, one of the founding people. And so I think you will find the, the time interesting. What a wonderful way to spend the end of winter together, eating and being entertained. So I hope you can all make it and you can sign up online, okay? Thank you. This week, Tuesday evening, yes, this week, begins, I, just making sure it wasn't last week. Like I said, it's one of those weeks, folks. The Lenten prayer group will meet Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. in the chapel. It is being run both by Reverend Katrina and by Gerald Wall. I think we all might use a little prayer this week. A reminder that next week, Sunday, after worship, there will be a congregational meeting at which the FAF Architectural Group will present their feasibility study to the congregation. Also next week, Sunday, we hope to have a presentation about the civil rights pilgrimage and to speak about our experiences on that trip. Um, the four days that I spent and the five days that the rest of the group spent on the trip. For those of you who were on the pilgrimage, could we meet just briefly right after worship in the assembly hall so we can coordinate next week, Sunday's events. And that's it. Short announcements this week. Something's wrong. Did we forget something else? <laughs> Blind injustice this afternoon at Montclair State. Steve Osting will be there a half hour early in order to hand tickets to those of you who have signed up for Blind Injustice. Now, have we forgotten anything else before this worship service ends? Then let's stand and join together singing God of grace and God of glory.
friends, may the God who shakes heaven and earth, whom death could not contain, who lives to disturb and heal us, bless you with the power to go forth and proclaim the gospel. Amen.